excited to bring up our first speaker. Enon Kreitz is the chairman and CEO of Mattel, a leading global toy company and uh, owner of the strongest portfolio of family entertainment uh, out there. He joined the company in April 2018, was appointed chairman in May 2018. Under Enon's leadership, Mattel Films has announced 14 live action motion pictures in active development with major partners, including their first movie, you might have heard of it, Barbie. Welcome, Enon. Hi, okay. how are you? How are you? Welcome, welcome, welcome. Hi, thank the, you for inviting me. So, I, I'm so glad to have you. This is not your first rodeo at the Grill. We've had you before when uh, you were on your last gig at Maker Studios. Enon is a serial risk taker, let's just say that. Um, amazing 2018. Uh, Mattel has had four CEOs in four years. You're on the board. They offer you the job. What were you thinking? Well, um, Mattel is one of the most iconic companies in corporate America. And what really attracted me is the opportunity to transform the toy business, the core toy business, and then on top of that, start to capture full value from our intellectual properties as the owner of one of the strongest portfolio in the world in children and family entertainment, I saw and I believe there's an opportunity to transform the company from being a toy manufacturer that was making item into an IP company that manages franchises. And this is where we realize that people who buy our product are not just consumers, they are fans. And once you realize you have fans in the aggregate, this is an audience, it changes the conversation and it opens up a whole new set of opportunities for Mattel on top of what we do within the toy aisle. So think film, television, live events, uh, digital experiences, um, uh, musicals, and so forth. And so when you took this on, you, you came with that, con that's why you said this is an unexploited new strategy, basically? That's right. Yeah, the company went through uh, a challenging time, and I believe that we can, by, by restoring uh, the, the strength of the company within the toy business, we can significantly create you know, new value in terms of uh, top line and, and restoring profitability. And we've done very much that in the first four years. We took our adjusted EBITDA from $125 million to over a billion dollars. Wow. And this is yeah. just within the core toy business. Uh, and so the opportunity was fix the core toy business and then on top of that, grow your IP strategy that in success can be transformative. And the opportunity for us was to participate in highly accredited business verticals that in some cases are bigger than the toy industry. And that was the opportunity. And it's not to say that the toy part of our business is not exciting because toys as a category is a hundred billion dollar industry. We are a, a global leader. We have an opportunity to continue to grow that business and capture more profitability. So we're not walking away from that. The opportunity was on top of that to expand our business into entertainment. And, do and you, but do you expect entertainment to be bigger than your core business ultimately? We haven't sized the relative uh, dimension, but we did say in success it can be transformative. And the analogy that we used to refer to early on was to think of Marvel, which mm -hmm. yeah, of course. was a comic book publisher. And you were at Disney anyway before and this, before well, Mattel, you'd well, been at Disney. That's but, right. But the, the opportunity is really to, to reimagine your business model. And what's unique about toys, toys are tactile. Our fans touch our product, they hug our product, they go to bed with our product. Mm. It's inspirational and aspirational and you have a very strong emotional bond and connection with your fans. So once you establish that and you have a thriving toy business, the opportunity is to take that relationship, that emotional connection, and extend that to other areas. And in itself, it's not an invention. This is not a unique model to Mattel, mm -hmm. but we start the journey being a toy company as opposed to being a comic book publisher. Right. And in success, if we execute it well, it can be very meaningful. Well, let's, let's talk about execution. So, so once you'd made that strategic decision, how did you decide 
to start with Barbie. And, and again, I'm just going to point out, we all know Barbie is a massive success, but try to think back to when it's all just a blank sheet of paper and you have to make choices. So how did you decide on Barbie? And then I think you mentioned also you were wondering whether to even do it as live action and maybe do it as animated. So talk us through a little bit of the, your thinking. Yeah, so while we started to restore the core toy business, we also started to focus in parallel on, on our IP strategy. And the idea was to try to create a cultural event. It wasn't about making movies in order to sell more toys. It was about making a statement and creating something unique that will stand out. And the, you can say one of the most complicated projects would have been Barbie, uh, and not just Barbie, but live action as opposed to animation, in order to really uh, uh, achieve what we were aiming to, to do, which was to create a quality experience. And, and the approach was this, was the, the belief and the, 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 uh, our strategy was to create quality content that people want to watch. And that was how we approached it. And we knew that if we do that, and people watch our content and, 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 and like what we do, and, and establish an emotional connection with our product, good things will happen. Mm -hmm. And it will also translate to business uh, results. But the initial approach was about creating quality content. And our vision for Mattel Films, which at that time was an idea, a, a concept, was to collaborate with leading filmmakers to create standout quality movies based on our iconic brands that resonate in culture and will appeal to global audiences. So and whose decision was it to, to just start with Barbie? But Well, it was okay. my decision at okay. the time. Uh -huh. um, and you know, the, the idea was to partner with the best, and Margot was at the time. Margot uh, Robbie. Margot Robbie. Um, Margot Robbie was, um, uh, you know, an obvious partner, a uh, great actor that can play across multiple genres and, um, and, and, and has a real quality uh, uh, capabilities for performance. So, so let's talk about the, so, so your first, okay, uh, maybe it's not a risky choice, maybe it's an obvious choice, Bar Barbie's probably your best known brand, but it's kind of old. Right, I mean, Barbies was more like when I was a kid. I don't. I, when I raised my kids, I didn't. She did not play with Barbies. So you're you're reviving something that has maybe a lot of affection, but maybe it's an older audience. You're maybe you're worrying. I don't know. But then you bring in Margot, and then you make this other really, I think, risky decision to hire Greta Gerwig and Noah Baumbach to write the script, which um, are not is not is not a soft and fuzzy approach. So. How, how did you feel about that? Was that a Warner decision? Was that a Margot decision? I'm sure you had to sign off on that, right? Well, the, the approach was to creating something that will break convention. We did not want to make something traditional and obvious. We did want to create something unique, something different, something that will stand out. And we wanted to collaborate with the best partners out there. And that was part of the idea, to create a home for real creative filmmakers with a unique perspective, with a, with a unique voice that will bring their capabilities and create something special. And uh, Margot Robbie was the one who suggested uh, Greta. Greta. Um, mm -hmm. they, she and I uh, loved the idea. We were very involved in the process. Greta and, and, uh, and Noah uh, uh, together wrote the script. Mm -hmm. And eventually, Greta decided to direct the movie. But we love Greta uh, as, as an auteur. As a, as a standout creator that had a very unique voice already back then. But the then. idea that she's making basically a very politically um, um, enga engaged or aware, it's a politically aware film, and it has a political message around feminine, you can either say empowerment or, you know, the, fem the, the, a fe the female experience of today, which is throughout Greta's work, by the way, which we love, um, did... Not to mention the fact that the CEO of Mattel's in the script is this like, you know, wacky, um, hapless villain. How are you with that? <laughs> well, we embrace self-deprecation. Uh, we know what we stand for. We know what Mattel stands for. Okay, and but when you read the script and you saw that, like, what did you think? I loved the script from day one. And we know that this was part of, part of the narrative. It wasn't, we know what Mattel is and, and, and how much we do. Uh, you it, know what Mattel is, but the, the whole rest of the world doesn't really know. Now, now they think you're Will Ferrell. 
I'll take that any day of the week. I'm a big <laughs> fan of Will, uh, ever since the Zoolander days. Uh, and he's a great actor, he's hilarious, and he can get away with a lot more than I can, um, I assure you that. <laughs> but it was really about um, it cr taking, uh, and the genius of Greta, which, what she did in this movie, she took Barbie's purpose, which is to inspire the limitless potential in every girl. She took that message and made the movie relevant to everyone. And every person who went to the movie took something else out of it and related to it in a different way. And many people went to the movie two and even three times, and every time you go to the movie, you discover another dimension that you didn't see before. And that is really about her true genius, how she was able to do that. We ourselves embraced our role. Uh, it was her idea, her invention to put Mattel and the CEO in, in the narrative. It was her, her interpretation, and we supported her. We supported her all the way. We wanted to amplify what she created, and this is really in line you, with- You had no PR advice on this whatsoever, I'm thinking. <laughs> I'm totally well, joking, I'm joking. It was, you know, we, we really- <laughs> They're like, this could go, it, it, you never thought it could go sideways, that it could go wrong, having the Mattel brand we, as part of the story. We really trusted the process, mm. trusted her creative, judgment, and we're happy to amplify the message. And this was really in, in keeping with our approach of collaborating with leading filmmakers, let them interpret our brands in their own way, with their own vision. And this is what a creative process is all about. If you work with talented people, you support them, you amplify them, you let them be who they are, magic happens. And this is what we were trying to achieve. And and the result uh, played out in, in a way that, uh, of course, we're very excited and, and, yeah. and, and you know, proud to see the, uh, the way the movie resonates in culture and, and appeals to audiences uh, all over the world. So at what point, and, w and Josh Goldstein from Warner Brothers, who re le um, led the marketing campaign, which was quite brilliant, is going to be here to, to talk about that and other things later today. But I do want to ask, were you surprised, and at what point did you, at, 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 at the sort of buzz and success, and at what point did you realize you had a massive hit on your hands? Well, we always knew this movie, or well, I believe this movie will be a winner. Uh, because of Greta, because of Margot, because of Ryan, because of Mark Ronson, who was producing the, mm -hmm. the music, and Warner Brothers, who... Warner Brothers have been... But like, you're, the movie's coming out, like, are you feeling it like a month out, six weeks out? Are you seeing tracking numbers? You're like, what's going on? Something's well, happening? We, you, you could feel the buzz uh, way before the movie came out. You could see it in social media. You can see it in the audience excitement. You can see the, uh, the way the internet, you know, blew out with a couple of pictures appeared yep. from uh, Margot and Ryan rollerblading at, in, in Venice. And little snippets came out, came out about the movie um, well before it actually released. So we know it's building up. Warner did uh, incredible, incredible work on, 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 on creating excitement and, and amplifying the, the, the interest in the movie. And then we came with our marketing capabilities and what we do in demand creation because we, we generate demand for our product year, year in and year out without a movie. And at the time, before the movie came out, Barbie was already one of the strongest brands in the industry. In fact, Barbie was the number one uh, toy in the entire toy industry, not just in dolls, for two years in a row. So Barbie was already a very known brand. And Barbie has a built-in fan base that is very passionate and excited about, uh, about the brand well outside the toy aisle. So you take that. You take an incredible product that is being put together by a true auteur, um, uh, a creative masterpiece, and then you engage, you engage fans out there. This is not about classic and traditional movie marketing. This was not that. This was about how do you engage fans and create real excitement, real, real anticipation. And yeah, well, by the time I, the movie I, came I, out, it, 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 it was obvious. It, it was obvious then, perhaps. But I would say what was one of the amazing things about this marketing campaign, which we wrote just a, we wrote a couple weeks out, just about the campaign, because it was ubiquitous. The colors and the, the feeling 
in a way that we haven't seen in a long time, quite honestly. But it, I was amazed to see it, uh, uh, you know, on, in, on sports channels. I was amazed to see, you know, I know they built a, a Malibu house in Malibu, but there, th this was the marketing was, uh, I, and I know that it was done all across Warner Brothers Discovery, all of their different channels. But I would think that's wasted money. Men are not going to go see this movie, but. It, it, it turned out to be a good decision. That's right, and Warner did leverage their platform across all, all, the, all dimensions to, to promote uh, and push the movie, and, and in that regard, did a terrific job. And then the, the, what we did see is that the movie appealed not just for girls who buy right. uh, dolls, but or also- Or girls who play, or women who had played with right. them. It right. was really the for all kids. demographics, men, women, um, all their uh, you know, second generation, even third generation of fans. And that was really what turned the movie to become a cultural phenomenon outside of a traditional movie uh, uh, that is released as part of uh, you know, the release schedule of a I studio. mean, there, there were a couple things also that I would raise. One is I think it's just been a pretty dismal time in general in the world, and this felt like a joyful experience. And the other thing is that you know people made it an experience of going to the movie, going to the theater to see it, right. which was something that we hadn't had in a long time. It actually even drove, helped drive this three-hour Oppenheimer movie, which is nothing to do with it, right? But it, it, it gave a big lift to everything. So just as a reminder, the movie did 1.4 billion globally. Is that where we're at now, right? Yep, it's, it's even slightly uh, more than that. And I remember just talking about the cultural um, moment when I, the day of the release of the movie, I was in New York with my daughter and how, we, Who's how old? She's 19. 19. Mm -hmm. And we were, said, let's go and check out uh, the Regal Theater um, um, in the downtown yeah. by, by Union Square. And, yeah. and already on the way to the theater, you could see droves of people wearing pink. Not even going to the movie, by the way. <laughs> Just everybody was wearing pink. And by the time we got to the theater, uh, it was mayhem. And they, wow. they, they, we walked in, they had 20 shows that opening night, 20 different shows. Five were running concurrently at different times, but we walked into every, every, every screen uh, to, to see what's happening. And of course, it was sold out. Uh, I talked to the ushers and they said, like, this is, this is crazy. Uh, you know, the, the excitement around the movie. And we could, different parts of each movie that we walked into the theater, people were just laughing their heart out, people were crying, people were cheering. Uh, you could see the, the reaction to the movie, and you know, you know that this is not your traditional movie. Uh, we knew it before, but there's nothing like the opening night when you mm -hmm. see the reaction. And of course, this is one theater, uh, as uh, out of thousands and thousands of theaters that, that show the movie, but, but we know that we, we had the winner. And we knew that early on, in working with Greta and to see how much attention and, and how much creativity and imagination she brought into this and turn it into what it eventually became uh, a true uh, creative masterpiece. Mm. Way, and not just a traditional movie. And that was going back to your early part of your conversation. This was, this was what we were hoping to achieve. Mm -hmm. uh, from the very beginning, we used the terminology cultural event. It was not just a, a, not about making a movie in order to sell more toys, and it wasn't even about just making, about making a movie. It was about creating something unique that will stand out in culture and have societal impact. E easy to say and hard, very hard to do, so, so congratulations. And I should add that it added, uh, you guys have announced $125 million last quarter to, or for the year, to Mattel's bottom line. So not too shabby, not, not counting dolls, sales, I presume. Um, so let's, in our, we only have a couple of minutes left, let's talk about how you're going to do that again. <laughs> right, that's the thing, you've got to do it again. Um, you've got, um, first of all, is there going to be, Barbie 2 is going to come? Are you guys going to announce that? Feel free to announce it today. <laughs> well, the, you know, we're, we're not saying that every movie out of the 14 that we've announced will be another Barbie, but we are saying that we will uh, use the same approach in attracting, collaborating, amplifying, and partnering with leading, uh, creating but talents. We, but we can expect a Barbie too, is what I'm saying. Well, uh, what, we all, what we did say broadly is that we're looking to build film franchises. Yeah. 
this is not just about Barbie, but right. our approach and what we believe is an opportunity, given the strength of our brands, is to build film franchises. It's a simple question. <laughs> <laughs> and it's a simple answer. Uh, it's, it's, um, you know, it is, it is a moment for Mattel, um, and it's exciting to see our strategy playing out. Okay, you're not going to answer. And what about, what about, what about um, your other properties that are coming up? Hot Wheels, um, Polly Pocket, Barney, Matchbox? Um, are these, these are the next series. Yeah, we, when will we see? So we, we partner with amazing creators, uh, with the J.J. Abrams to produce Hot Wheels, with the Skydance who will produce Matchbox. Uh, Tom Hanks is our partner for Major Matt Mason. Vin Diesel is partnering with us for a uh, uh, Rock'em Sock'em Robot. Uh, so what, and what's, but what's next in production? Uh, we ahead haven't ahead. announced uh, yet but the next again, movie. But you can. <laughs> Sharon, she is so friendly uh, <laughs> and so accommodating. In a, in a, in a very warm and yes. supportive way. Uh, yeah. It's, uh, we'd love to announce, but we're not ready to do it today. Mm -hmm. But, you know, there's a lot that is going on. We when do you expect the next movie to be in, in production? What would be your goal? Well, now that we're out of the strike, we can resume yeah. the work that we've been doing. We've made a lot of progress before the strikes, and we now uh, expect to come back and accelerate uh, our processes. The, the way we operate, we have a virtual studio model in that we don't employ people uh, a gr right. big group in the company. Robbie Brenner is running um, this division, and the entire approach is about collaboration with top talent and becoming the home. So, of so, no, so you can't predict exactly, but your no. but your hope would be like next year already, or is that too? Well, the you know it's hard to tell because these right. processes take their own dynamics. But what we are looking to do is to do that at scale. Mm -hmm. We work with, uh, we don't have an output deal with any one studio. Right. We work with uh, all, all, all partners. And we try to match the, the right creative leader and the right studio per project. And we believe that is what made Barbie so unique in, in really finding that, that combination. Well, if you could, if you could choose, you, you, you would want to be in production I presume next year, right? I would think, but you have to have a, a, a completed script. You have to have. It's it's hard to tell. So at you've this got point. you've got several. We got multiple projects. Projects that we and are so advancing whichever one's ready. In different stages of development, and the way it works is, you know, it, it's it's dynamic. Yeah. But the the opportunity we have in doing running across multiple projects and having creative partners that are in the lead mm -hmm. and they're driving, uh, they're running with the ball. Uh, that gives us opportunity to have multiple uh, projects in, in motion, and we will continue to collaborate with talent, amplify what they do, leverage the strength of our brands to create excitement and anticipation in the marketplace, and then bring our marketing and, crea and, and demand creation capabilities to create cultural events. Amazing. Okay. Well, thank you for coming, Enon. Congratulations again on thank the you, phenomenal Sharon. success. We're thank so glad you. to have you. Come back next year. You'll tell us some more. Thank, thank you. you.